Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Wadier. And I'm Tommy Welling, and you're listening to the Fasting for Life podcast. This podcast is about using fasting as a tool to regain your health, achieve ultimate wellness, and live the life you truly deserve. Each episode is a short conversation on a single topic with immediate actionable steps. We cover everything from fat loss and health and wellness to the science of lifestyle design. We started Fasting for Life because of how fasting has transformed our lives, and we hope to share the tools that we have learned along the way. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Fasting for Life podcast. My name is Dr. Scott Wadier, and I'm here, as always, with my good friend and colleague, Tommy Welling. Good afternoon to you, sir. Hey, Scott. How are you? Doing fantastic, my friend. I realize that we always record in the afternoon because I never say good morning to you on the intros of these podcasts. I wonder if somewhere in yeah, the true. in the in the uh, library of episodes there is one of those, but it's 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 typically the afternoon. So I'm excited about today's conversation. Yeah. Uh, welcome to all the new listeners into the Fasting for Life podcast. If you are new, head back to episode 0 and episode 1, give us a listen. 20 or 30 minutes you'll learn who we are, why we're here, why we started the podcast and how we feel uh, that fasting has given us our lives back. But more Mm -hmm. importantly, started this fasting for life journey and lifestyle that has been so sustainable for us and so many of you listeners. Uh, For you long-term listeners, welcome back to today's episode. Today, we're going to be revisiting a conversation that we got a ton of response from. And it was the episode that we just released a few episodes ago, and that was episode 119. And we talked about what is visceral fat? the association of adiponectin and visceral fat with insulin resistance. So we Mm talked a lot about insulin resistance and and how fasting taps into that to allow us to get the weight off and regain our health and improve our blood work and prevent disease, et cetera, reverse diabetes. But that was so, there's so much here to unpack that we're gonna come back and talk about it a little bit differently today, give you some more action steps, right? We talked about reference ranges last time, which are really hard to find, Mm -hmm. uh, why it matters and how it's related to cardiometabolic disease and metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease and certain cancers and diabetes and all of these other things that we are 1000% yeah. dealing with here in the States and across the world uh, as we incur this weight and obesity, you know, diabetes epidemic uh, yeah. that no one seems to be talking about. And then we talked about what to do about it and gave you some action steps in the last episode. Uh, so if you want to start there, then go ahead and go back to episode 119 Uh, But today we're going to talk about that again because we feel it's that important and really going to be moving the construct from your standard operating. Okay, I go to the doctor every year. These are my metrics. These are my tests that are run because the question we get a lot is how do I test insulin resistance at home? How do I know if I'm insulin resistant? Right. So we have the insulin assessment on the website where you can go. It's a subjective test where you can track it over weeks to months and, Mm -hmm. and look at your score and see if you're improving you know, insulin resistance has a whole host of its own symptomatology, brain fog, tired after eating, poor sleep, cravings, cravings. Yep. Uh, you know, central, ad- um, you know, centralized adiposity, yeah. carrying the weight around the midsection, right? But there's so much subjectivity in that. We, we want to really hone in and level up. What are the metrics and numbers that we should be looking at? So today's conversation is going to land there. And then we're going to invite everybody to come into the free Fasting for Life community group to continue the conversation, get your questions answered. Um, and really maybe shed some light on, on on how this resonates with you or is pushing your boundaries a little bit in, okay, is this something I need to worry about? And mm-hmm. our our take home from today is going to be, yes, we want to put this in a, in a little box for you and then give yeah. you the support you need to kind of unpack it. So Tommy, I know I just said a lot of words um, <laughs> and you can tell I'm fired up today yeah, uh, about too. this because mm-hmm. this is something that I personally am working on my last seven pounds of visceral adiposity. Yeah. And I'm working on the last few points of elevated fasting insulin and right. my blood sugar numbers have come dramatically down. So I'm I'm personally working on this. So how do we level it up? How do we get better results? How do we get to the end goal, which is long-term health, vitality, wellness, and uh, living at an ideal weight? Uh, well, today we're going to unpack some of that. And we're going to start with a fun topic or a fun word uh, of fructose. And how this this has been demonized in certain way in a certain light, but we're also going to talk about how it is something that we need to address, and how that cascade lends itself to ending up in a place where you have visceral adiposity and all the other stuff I just mentioned. Yeah, and, and uh, fructose is an interesting one because 
you know, how it's actually processed within the body is is not oftentimes talked about or it's it's easily misunderstood. And so, you know, some of the important things to to understand are that when we're eating processed carbohydrates, they tend to be high in fructose. And a lot of the things, a lot of the the big offenders that we could be eating are oftentimes broken down into fructose. And the important thing there to remember is that we're going to have to process those through the liver and that's going to directly relate to the visceral adipose tissue that you've been talking about. And the the fact of the matter is that if we can understand that fructose is directly related to insulin resistance and visceral adipose tissue, we can now see that there is a, a substantial linkage there that we can control for one and have an impact on the other. And now we really can start to move the needle in the right direction on a really, really important health marker that's oftentimes not talked about. Yeah. So what is fructose, right? Like, well, it's a very sweet sugar. It's a food additive, high fructose corn syrup, and all of the other incarnations of the name added. Anytime you see added sweetener, typically it's, it could fall in that category, right? Yeah. So the whole point is not to uh, bastardize fructose and make it out to be, you know, the cause of everything, but the mm. connection point from fructose to visceral adiposity and potentially insulin resistance, but from fructose to visceral adiposity, right? And what's happening physiologically and why then does it matter that we should be watching out for this and then mm. also limiting our processed carbohydrates? So some of the the foods that are highest in fructose. Now, there's fruits on here, okay? There's fructose and broccoli. Nobody Mm -hmm. got 30 pounds of extra visceral adipose tissue or is 50 (laughs) pounds overweight by eating too much broccoli or having too many pears, okay? Good point, yep. So the the tricky part about fructose is that it doesn't spike blood sugar. And Tommy, I want you to unpack in just a second what actually happens in the Mm -hmm. body, which leads to the visceral adipose tissue being increased, right? Okay, yeah. So- the tricky thing is, is that it, like glucose uh, or sucrose, which is half fructose and glucose, it doesn't spike your blood sugar necessarily, okay? Yeah. It's not typically going to do that unless it's combined with something else. So fruit juices is the number one culprit. It has nine teaspoons of fructose in a 16 ounce glass, right? right. Sugary soft drinks. So these are some of the things, okay, yeah, I know. I've heard about you know the, the fruit juice companies. They're loaded with carbs. They're, well, it's not just the carbohydrate. It's the fructose specifically, right? Right. And, you know, sweetened fruit yogurts, packaged baked goods, like the bakery section of the grocery store, mm-hmm. salad dressings, pasta sauces that have added sweeteners to them, right? Yeah. You Heck, even loaves of bread have... Yeah. And crackers and and those little prepackaged crackers can have some of this stuff in it, right? So, you know, when we're looking at the sources, we want to be able to identify, okay, why why should we care about fructose? But then where is it hiding in in the things yeah. that we don't typically think about? Um, that it that it, the the one that gets me the most. This is crazy, and then I'll, then then I want to unpack it. Is number eight on the list from the myfooddata.com is a Burger King Whopper, Mm. a Subway chicken teriyaki sandwich, one slice of DiGiorno frozen pizza, one packet of McDonald's sweet and sour sauce, right? So the sauce, so those were a few that like, boom, kind of hit me in the face. I was like, wow, I never would have even thought that, even being this far into it. Yeah, and like a, a double whammy is when you put like a jelly or a jam on top of a cracker or some toast or some bread. Right. And because even even if it's not that many calories, like if you're tracking your macros, you're tracking your calories, or you're saying, well, okay, I'm, I'm still in a calorie deficit here. But the problem here is that those grams that are coming in, in the jelly on top of the cracker or on top of the, the bread, and if I have any fruit juice, you know, it's compounding the problem because the this is actually going to have to get filtered through the liver. And this is what you were talking about earlier is the fact that it, it can almost be it can almost be tricking us because if you're tracking your blood sugar, you might not notice that big of a blood sugar spike with a lot of these fructose heavy foods. And so you might think to yourself, oh, well, it's it's not contributing to my insulin resistance or prediabetes or any any sort of problem here, right? Because I'm tracking my numbers. My blood sugar doesn't yeah. rise when I eat when I have a V8 for breakfast. Right, yep. 
Yep. And, or one and, of those little those little green nature juices, right? Oh, it's healthy. Yeah. And that's why we we did the episode around the the food compass, right? What is healthy, what is not healthy? And we're gonna make it super simple, but mm -hmm. looking for those sources. So if it's not spiking blood sugar, then what is it doing? How does that end up at the end road of increasing the visceral adiposity? Because the research out there, it there is on both sides of the aisle, it can show a link directly to insulin resistance. But right. it makes sense to me that it wouldn't if it's not spiking your blood sugar, then, you know, you, your insulin isn't needed to then process that energy out of the bloodstream. Right. So it can bypass that system, go straight to the liver. And, and that's where the problem lies, because the liver has has a little bit of of sugar storage capacity. It can it can store about 100 grams of sugar. But if if you've ever increase your weight. If you've ever been gaining weight, you've had a full liver, a liver full of glycogen where it couldn't store anymore. So then it immediately had to start producing additional fat stores that were going to be deposited either around your midsection or somewhere else on your body. But so, so what's happening with the fructose directly is it's going to the liver and instead of getting, getting processed, um, how we normally think of, of sugar and, and raising uh, sugar levels in the bloodstream, it's actually going to increase the triglycerides in the blood because when it runs into full glycogen storage, it's going to end up leaking out as triglycerides and other lipids in the blood, which directly goes to visceral adipose tissue deposition right there. So, so you're, you're thinking I'm, I'm bringing in some sugar, but my blood sugar is not going up. So that's good, right? But it, it's going straight to visceral adipose tissue, which is the worst possible kind. It's just, it's a fast track to exactly where we don't want to go. You said the word fast. And that's why in the last yeah. episode, when we talked about uh, that, the visceral adipose tissue versus subcutaneous, right? And that's why we're like, okay, well, what's one of the main things you do? Well, you can deplete the short-term glycogen stores, right? So then if you do come across some, some fructose that's hiding, that's lurking beneath the surface, yeah. then your body's going to be able to process it better. It's not going to be clogging up the liver, mm. it's not going to be clogging up those energy pathways, Great right? Point. So yeah. fasting is, is obviously we talk a lot about insulin resistance with fasting. By fasting, you're over time, you're decreasing the time that your insulin is high, you're decreasing the uh, or increasing the effectiveness of the amount of insulin. So that's the insulin sensitivity piece, mm -hmm. which is really the the main cog in the weight loss resistance. Oh, I've I can't get the weight off. I can't keep the weight off. Oh, is it my thyroid? Oh, is it my hormones? Oh, is it insert reason here, right. fasting allows you to kind of break that pattern, right? So when you said the word fast, I was like, oh yeah, fasting for like podcasts. Why does this matter? Why are we talking about this? Well, <laughs> you know, leveling up the metrics, leveling up what we should be mm -hmm. focusing on and why getting the weight off matters. And when people ask me now, well, what's your weight? What's your, are you at maintenance? And I'm like, well, no, because I still have some visceral adipose tissue to work on. Okay. Right. So the connection piece from the front end makes sense. Okay, fructose to uh, bypassing the system, clogging up the matrix, right? Increasing the visceral adipose tissue. We under, we know that it can show in some studies uh, a correlation between insulin resistance and other studies, it doesn't. But having the, the article that we started this conversation, we kind of had to reverse engineer it was, can visceral adiposity index? So can the VAI serve Again, back to the conversation of what should we be tracking? What are the conversations we're having with our doctors? Why is this not being talked about? Can mm -hmm. visceral adiposity index, right, serve as a simple tool for identifying individuals with insulin resistance in daily clinical practice? Why does that matter? Because insulin resistance is known to be a precursor to prediabetes and blood sugar related issues. Right. Okay. Right. So how can we catch this sooner and not just wake up one day and, oh my God, my blood sugars are all over the place. And every year it's been a little less energy, a little more brain fog, a couple, you know, another belt loop, a couple more pounds, Yeah. you know, uh, maybe a medication or two because your blood pressure is now and your cholesterol numbers are now ticking up over the decades, right? So can the visceral adiposity index serve as that simple tool combined with HOMA IR which is a calculation based off your insulin and fasting numbers. And we're going to unpack this here. So don't worry. We're not going to be like, oh, great. See you guys later. Have a great episode. Um, <laughs> it, so the VAI, Tommy, uh, is based on four metrics. And it's not perfect, but in combination with these other things, I, I believe we're getting a heck of a lot closer. Yeah, when we start talking about visceral adiposity, index, it's it's really cool because, um, you know, like we can't all just go have a DEXA scan 
um, every week or, or every couple of months and, and go look at, at how much visceral adipose tissue we actually have. But with, with, with some more, more easily uh, determinable numbers, we can start to put together the fact that the, the VAI is actually heavily correlated with cardiometabolic risk and with metabolic syndrome indicators and markers. So it, it's, it's actually accounting for um, about 45 to 54% of the correlation there to actually predict what the HOMA IR, like the, the actual level of insulin resistance for somebody is going to be even before they start to put any extra weight on. So even in normal weight individuals, it's still accounting for insulin resistance long before the, the weight actually starts to accumulate. And then as we start to get into overweight and obese, it, it becomes an even stronger predictor potentially. But, but that's, that's just really cool to give us uh, data what's going on under the hood well before we would normally say like, well, uh, you know, my, my weight's been creeping up over time. Like what's going on here? Yeah. So the, v the VAI itself is based on waist circumference, BMI, uh, triglycerides and your HDL. Okay. So it is a, mm -hmm. It's just go get a calculator. Don't try to do this on your own. It's like WC divided by 36.58 plus 1.89. Don't, don't, right. don't, don't go <laughs> back into calculus. Don't, don't worry about it. No, right. We so can link to it. Yeah. Yeah. Link to it. Great. You'll see the link. And there's also going to be an, uh, one for the HOMA IR, right? So mm. you need to know your waist circumference. You need to know your BMI. You need to know your triglycerides. You need to know your HDL, right? So you said there, so we can estimate, you know, in healthy weight individuals, right, is what we're seeing 50% correlation. Yeah. Now, again, causation is not correlated, but there is a very strong correlation here. And I know personally, you know, that's why I'm working on this. So VAI mm -hmm. includes those four metrics. And then HOMA IR is going to be your insulin, your fasted insulin and your fasting glucose. And that's going to give you a score. And for that score, just go use the calculator. Uh, don't try to do it on your own, especially if you're using international units, millimoles versus, you know, US no, yeah, for, mil per deciliter. Yeah, right. So okay. <laughs> us here, we like to do things differently here in the U.S. Okay, we get it. I, I would right. love to just go to international and metric because it's just you just move the decimal points a little bit easier, right? Right. It makes sense. Yeah. So, just makes more sense to me. Anyway, so uh, when you're looking at HOMA IR, you know, less than one is ideal, showing that you have insulin sensitivity in an ideal range. Levels above 1.9 is early insulin resistance, right? So the the problem is beneath the surface lurking, right? Mm -hmm. And then above 2.9 is significant insulin. So I'm actually, you know, at the at the lower end, I'm at like 2.19 if I put in my numbers. Mm -hmm. So my insulin resistance number has dropped dramatically from the from the 20s. You know, the range there is between like five and 24 or 25. Uh, mm -hmm. When I first started, I was up in the the high teens. Now I'm down in the in the low single digits, right? middle single nice. digits getting closer yeah. to that five range. But you just take your your fasted insulin number, your fasted glucose, right? And you plug those into this equation. Now you have metrics combined with the VAI, the waist circumference, the BMI, the triglycerides, the HDL. And now you actually have an idea of, okay, where am I? You know, what is my visceral adiposity? You know, we mentioned it in the episode 119 to go get a DEXA scan, it's 60 or 70 yeah. bucks, get the scan done. If you're gonna have a medical procedure, right, or a CT scan or an MR, you can ask them to, ask your doctor to give you a, a, a VAT reading, oh, right? Cool. Yeah. And this is gonna give you some, some more uh, idea on where you're at and why it matters, right? So I know there's lots of, the takeaway here, as we kind of zoom back out to big picture is, the weight in itself is the motivating factor for most people to start fasting. Right. But it's the carrying of that weight or the slight increase of that weight or the yo-yoing of that weight over the years that leads to all of the other comorbidities and mm. issues that come along with it. You know, the the power that I'm I'm hearing right here in this scenario is like, even if I didn't have any weight to lose, but let, let's say it's 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 not a lot, I'd still like to get rid of it. I'm, I'm curious if other things are happening that I should be concerned about or that maybe right. I could prevent now if I if I kind of get a handle on this thing. Well, I can use these tools to understand a little bit better what's going on under the surface, then do something about it. But it also gives me a stronger reason. Like in a previous episode, we talked about willpower and but how 
how willpower is is not very strong and it's actually the i want power that has that really really motivating effect to actually move us forward and so when we start to understand what's going on under the hood and go yeah you know what actually my insulin resistance is not where it should be here you know what i i want to do i want to get this under control so i can have more energy 10 years from now 20 years from now keep up with the kids or with the grandkids like now you're starting to to direct me towards some long-term goals that I really want besides just, yeah, could I drop this 15 pounds, 20 pounds on the scale? That would be nice, but it, it doesn't have a lot of, a lot of like weight, a lot of teeth to it, a lot of grip, right? Yeah. And so combining the, the fact that we started this conversation and got a ton of feedback, a ton of questions like, all right, we need to land the plane on this, right? And, yeah. and give some actionable stuff. And one of the, you just said two things there. One was, you know, um, maybe you are at an ideal weight or you're close to maintenance. And why does, why should I concern myself with visceral fat? Right. We know sure. how important it is. And there's a study here, uh, Dr. Sean uh, O'Mara on, on Instagram and I had seen it and it like stuck out in my brain where there was a reference article there where stopping eating all processed carbohydrates eliminated visceral fat without exercising. Wow. So went from 5.6 pounds down to 1.8 pounds in, in like in, in 35 weeks. Wow. So, so that's some that's major incredible. change. Now, yeah. I, I just, he came from the standpoint of the, uh, the, the TOFI category. So the thin outside fat inside type yeah. individual right. and the, um, the correlation, the study that he was referencing that this one was kind of under the umbrella of, and the conversation he was having showed that there's an inverse relationship between the amount of visceral fat you have and the number of NK cancer destroying cells you have. So oh. the most obese cancer patients had the lowest number of NK cells in their tumors. So the, the relate, he was talking about the relationship of visceral adiposity in certain cancers, yeah. right? And the fact that there is a correlation there. So now we're not just talking about blood sugar, but we're talking about elevated levels of visceral fat and some thin people out there, like you look, you're like, oh, yeah, she has diabetes. Like, that doesn't make sense. Well, yeah, what's her visceral, visceral adiposity number? What is her uh, or his, you know, HOMA IR? What does the insulin resistance look like? Yeah. What yeah. is the lifestyle component? Right. So just trying to continue to piece this together. And the two takeaways from today's would be reducing those processed carbohydrates, because that's where a lot of the fructose hides. And then definitely yeah. reducing those 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 uh, direct fructose, high fructose corn syrups and all that other stuff, decreasing those, that consumption. And then, of yeah. course, going back to sticking to your fasting windows to decrease that insulin resistance and remove that uh, underlying kind of resistance and increase that insulin sensitivity by making those better yeah. food choices when you have your nutrition windows or your eating windows open up. Man, th this just this just brought me back to a couple of those like really indulgent meals. Like I'd, I'd love to have this as just a sound bite playing in my head whenever I was being tempted by like drinks and an appetizer and like a, a large you know meal at, at a restaurant where where I go yeah you know what I, that that all sounds really good but you, you start to put alcohol which is going to hit the liver with some sugary mixers that go into it with the appetizers the additional calories that are coming in I'm going to have a full glycogen full liver I'm going to be hitting it for filtration of the alcohol that's coming into the system and for the additional calories. You talk about like the perfect storm and I, I, I the, the, what's going on on the inside. You, you didn't even know the storm was coming. I, you, you didn't, it, it's, it's crazy. And then, and then to, to contrast that with, with how I feel and how simple it is to just set my timer, set my next fasting timer. Even if I did have a meal like that, but setting my next fasting timer, sticking to it, it's gonna be a little tougher after a meal like that. So I'm gonna to wanna to minimize you know, those, but, but it can still happen every once in a while. But setting that timer, getting to my next fasting time, letting the liver clear out of the stored glycogen, and re regenerate the, the the damage that was done during that that larger meal and burn through some of those calories and then start to tap into the long-term fat store like now we have just complete opposite end of the spectrum where i was heading the, the very wrong way before and now i can just be completely going in the opposite direction like like reversing the hands of time almost is, is what it is what it kind of feels like in that contrast I have a feeling that this isn't going to be the last time that we do an exact, uh, you know, an entirely dedicated episode to visceral fat. 
Agreed. I just have a feeling. But yeah. with that being said, you know, as we wrap up today's conversation, uh, we really want to encourage you guys to come into the Fasting for Life community. And um, it's something we've been saying more recent. We've kind of changed our, uh, we've gotten back to our roots and we want to make this more conversational as yeah. the podcast downloads continue to grow. And we're so grateful for all of you guys listening and being on this journey with us. Yeah. Um, we want this to be conversational. So with specifically with that and visceral adipose tissue from last episode of 119, we got a ton of feedback and questions. So click the link in the show notes. You can get the two calculators. They're in there for the home IR and for the VAI. You know, maybe think about, you know, have the conversation, get some of these tests, look in your area for a DEXA scan, go back and listen to 119 if you haven't listened yet. Yeah. And um, come to the group. And this week's discussion thread is going to be around this episode of these calculations. How do I get it? What does it look like? So I know there are going to be questions, right? Yeah. So come to the group, learn from everybody else. It is We are in the tree of trust, as we like to say. We mm -hmm. break the first two rules of fasting every single day. We've got great moderators. It's a really great group of experienced fasters, and it's all around the fasting for life journey and the fasting for life community, Tommy. So I'm pumped for yeah. this week's discussion. I know it's Me probably going to be a little bit more heavy, uh, but I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I just want to appreciate uh, all you guys for listening in. Thank you for the questions on the first episode that got us here. Yeah. Tommy, great conversation today uh, as we wrap up and uh, click the link for the community group. And uh, as always, we'll see you on the inside. Thank you, sir. Cool. Thank you. Bye. So you've heard today's episode and you may be wondering, where do I start? Head on over to thefastingforlife.com and sign up for our newsletter where you'll receive fasting tips and strategies to maximize results and fit fasting into your day-to-day -day life. While you're there, download your free Fast Start Guide to get started today. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to leave us a five-star review, and we'll be back next week with another episode of Fasting for Life.